I'm currently taking a healthcare policy class. This is required of us for all second year medical students and we got a chance to break up into small group discussions last Thursday to talk about this tragic case that happened to a nurse and a family that unfortunately is representative of the broader scheme of things in the United States and in the world when it comes to healthcare and that is preventable medical errors mistakes that could have been prevented that lead to deaths. Um, one of the things that you probably have heard is that 90 to 100,000 Americans each year die not because of heart disease or cancer but because of errors that could have been prevented. And I guess when you hear that kind of statistic you wonder well why don't like what's going on? You know are, are, the, are doctors and nurses just that bad? And I think one of the key points that our teachers wanted us, to wanted us to understand was that the best doctors, the best nurses, very good people, well-intentioned people, all make mistakes. And most of the time, 95% of the time, everybody is trying their best to not make a mistake, but the mistake happens anyways. And when that, kind of, when that uh, situation arises, you wonder, well then, what, is, what exactly is going on? And I think uh, very the data, the evidence is out there that what's going on is that there's something wrong with the current healthcare system and it's kind of set up for us humans to uh, fail basically. Um, and in the year 2000, the Institute of Medicine, which is the most prestigious academy of medicine, they published a report which is called To Err is Human, which is that uh, the, the general premise of the report was that we are fallible human beings. We make mistakes and we have to we have to set up our healthcare system in a way that acknowledges we make mistakes and that we can that we need to make the healthcare system such that there are triple checks, quadruple checks, um, double checks, this the same way the avia aviation industry has all these different safety precautions in place. Um, and so Going back to this story though, and hopefully, I, I know what I just said was kind of abstract, but hopefully um, if I frame it in this story, then you'll, you'll kind of know what I mean. Um, on July 5th, 2006, there was a pregnant mother who had a strep infection, and her doctor ordered the nurse to give um, intravenous antibiotics, so an antibiotic by vein. Now the nurse, her name was Julie, had been a very good nurse, 16 years of clean record, no problem with the law, no problem with medical practice, and she anticipated that the mother, because the mother was in labor, would need an epidural anesthetic. This is something that you give through the spine, and it can numb the pain so that the mother doesn't have to be in that much pain while she's in that part of pregnancy. Julie was had been working 16 hours straight, and I mean that was one of the things that shocked me, which is that this was 2006. And even after the Institute of Medicine report, which strongly recommended that nobody, no nurse should work for more than 12 hours straight because they know that after you work after more than 12 hours, you, the risks of making errors happen a lot, even to the most vigilant, to the most attentive people. When you're really tired, it's just very hard not to make a mistake. And what surprised me was that there's still, in many, many hospitals around the country and in the world, there aren't any limits on how many hours a nurse is allowed to make these mistakes, uh, how many hours a nurse is allowed to work for. And so Julie had been working for 16 consecutive hours, and she was very tired, but she was still trying to go, you know, 100%, and she anticipated that the mother would need an epidural anesthetic bag. Um, and so she brought it out, put it on the counter, now, at the same time, another nurse brought in an antibiotics bag, put it on the counter, and there are these two, uh, these two bags that looked very similar on the counter, and normally, at this point in time, the hospital usually has a barcoding system where you can scan the bags to make sure that you're actually getting the right drug. But those, that barcoding system was down for that week. And so, the nurses were told to just give the drug manually. And so you can probably already guess what happened. Um, Julie, being very tired, got the two bags mixed up and ended up giving the patient the um, intravenous 
ended up giving the patient the epidural anesthetic intravenously, which led to the patient um, dying of a cardiac arrest or her, her heart just stopped. So that was very tragic and my, heart's, uh, my thoughts and prayers go out to the family and they also go out to the nurse, uh, Julie, and everybody else who has had to experience some kind of tragedy like this, which is um, because one of the things that our teachers really, it was such an important message was that it's both, both families get devastated. The healthcare professional's family is devastated. The patient's family is devastated. And um, oftentimes, many, many of these mistakes occur because, not because of carelessness, not because of um, anybody's fault, not because of being tired or, uh, I mean, not because of um, not wanting to do the best thing, but because the system was in place, that there weren't any checks, and they're, they're overworking the people, too many multitasking events going on, and, um, and the healthcare professional usually takes the blame full on, like they feel so guilty, and many, many doctors and nurses who make these mistakes um, kind of just quit. They, it's very traumatic for them as well. And so what I want to do was not end on that tragic note, but kind of talk a little bit about the things that we can do to, to change the healthcare system. And this is something that already a lot of um, sort of very progressive healthcare experts, they're trying to work to change the system, to implement computerized systems, to kind of prevent the tragic mistakes that Julie made and to, um, but in addition, there are other simple things that you can do. For example, you can make the bags look really different, right? You can change the color of the bags. You can put the cabinets in very set, very different places that, so that it, could, it can never get mixed up. Um, small, simple things could really prevent these. And so that's kind of what I wanted to do um, with my next video, which I'm going to post as a video response um, to this one. And I know some of these things are kind of abstract, but I feel that if we, if we know more about them, then um, maybe we can make a difference. Because right now, for example, to have a computerized electronic record system that is very thorough throughout costs a lot of money, and the financial incentives aren't in place for many hospitals to put that, um, implement that new system. And that's just, that's very tragic. That's very unfortunate on so many fronts. Um, but I mean, on, on one obvious one is that, you know, by, uh, by not putting the system up, by not putting a better system up, you, so many people are suffering because of that. And the other thing is if you want to make a cold, practical, economical calculation, if you improve the system, you could actually end up saving more money and providing a more effective care. Um, so like from the, from the moral aspect, it's the right thing to do. And then from the economic aspect, it's also the right thing to do. So, um, okay, I think I'll stop there and I'll go on and talk about the sort of some of the specific changes that some of the hospitals are making that could have averted a tragedy that happened as recently as 2006. Um, thank you for listening.